Um, so yeah, so we're just going, just going to pass you across onto Paul now, and um, just going to admit this person and give Paul host, and Paul is just going to run us through his uh, lecture. Yeah, I think that should be you, Paul. He can still all hear me there, can he? Can indeed, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, don't actually Paul, know where... your microphone is on mute, if you can hear me. Yeah, sorry, my connection just dropped there, actually. And I've, yeah. um, and I've gone to my my 2.4 gig rather than my 5 gig network because the 5 gig one just went. Uh, it's not so cool working out of mission control now after all. <laughs> Indeed, <that's laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have these little difficulties, but um, there's always a way out of them. That's, a, that's the key thing, isn't it? Um, right, do you want me to... Uh, to share my screen. You can indeed, yeah. You can work away there now, Paul. Right, yes, and you're recording. That's that's uh, yeah. One thing I found yeah. out the hard way is that you have to start recording before you give the host to anybody the else. The rest of us will turn off yeah, our cameras and microphones. microphones. So right. So I will go and put this here. I'm sharing the sound and I'm gonna share that. And I'm going to Right, now can everybody hear me and see my PowerPoint? Yep, perfect. Good, okay. Well, all right, so this is really picking up from where I um, left off at the last Cosmos uh, back in two years ago, 2019. Um, and this is really, um, we covered at that point, um, what we did there, we sort of covered the, the, from the starting at the end of World War II and how the whole space race thing kicked off and went through Project Mercury, Gemini and Apollo, uh, covering all the various uh, uh, trials and a, a tragedy that uh, happened along the way and many triumphs, of course. And actually, on the 24th of July, 1969, um, John F. Kennedy's goal was actually met when uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. They spent uh, um, a couple of hours do it, doing uh, EVAs there, collecting some rocks and some basic science, um, then they did further missions. And they originally planned those missions to go up to Apollo 20 um, with, the, with the goal of exploring the moon more thoroughly. And along, alongside that, and we'll talk a bit about this as well, they had this idea called, that was christened the Apollo Applications Program. And that was where they sort of said, well, look, we've built all the stuff, so what else can we do with it? Um, and they came up with some great ideas for, for that as well, and we'll cover a bit of that. Um, but first of all, the next Apollo after um, after Apollo 11, sort of, they sort of did this as an insurance policy. Um, JFK's goal was to get to the moon within the decade. Um, if Apollo 11 hadn't actually managed to land, Apollo 12 was still in in that time frame, November 1969, and uh, and. And this is what it was, the second moon landing launch uh, command service module Yankee Clipper, lunar module Intrepid. And the idea was to execute a pinpoint landing, which Apollo 11, of course, was not. Apollo 11 was really quite a way off uh, uh, because they had the fuel problem and the boulders problem. And they um, didn't quite land anywhere really close to where they wanted to be. But Apollo 12 was to land within walking distance of Surveyor 3, which was one of the unmanned probes put down in uh, 1967. And they, they landed right next to that and actually managed to walk from Apollo 12, uh, from the Intrepid Lunar Module to that. They also wanted to get, this is the most comedy really these days, but um, uh, they wanted to get some color TV pictures. Apollo 11 uh, only had some really quite poor quality by modern standards, black and white. Um, TV cameras so they took a color TV camera and of course now TV cameras of that age they work by vacuum tubes and stuff and they were very very fragile and the first thing they did was it was pointed at the sun and that was the end of that 
Um, so, so that was uh, that. Um, uh, the launch, of course, and that went very well um, for the first 36 seconds at least. And what you have to understand really about launching rockets from, from Florida, if you, maybe if you've been to Florida, you sort of know what the, the, the weather is like there. And one of the features of what they get there is they get a lot of thunderstorms. And although there was no thunderstorm in progress at the launch of Apollo 12, um, what happens when you've got a 360 foot high rocket, um, which is made of metal, <gasps> And it launches and rocket fuel as it burns also conducts electricity. So you've got this ever extending upwards um, lightning conductor and there was enough charge in the air. Well, we'll see what happens. Trouble free launch and then all hell busted loose. Bus light, fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload one and two, main bus A and B out. We had some big glitch here, gang. I got AC. You got AC? Yes. Man, it's just the indicator. What do you got in the main bus? 24 volts. That's low. We got a short on it of some kind, but I can't believe that's accurate. Flight Ecom. Go Ecom. I I think it's a fuel cell bus failure. They've been thrown offline somehow. That must be why we're getting garbage here. Can they try SCE to AUX? Jared Griffin had never heard that command before. I'm pretty sure most of the people Mission Control had. Tell him. Apollo 12, Houston. Try SCE to auxiliary. Over. FCE to auxiliary? What the hell is that? CE. I'm not sure even Pete knew what that was. But one person did. I, I know what that is. Uh, SCE to AUX. We're getting good telemetry from you again. Try to reset your fuel cells. Reset fuel cells. Wait for staging. Wait for staging, yes. Hang on. Okay, uh, Houston GDC is good. We got a so good there, S2 game. Copy that, Pete. Now, You're looking good. Can I just ask every, some, somebody to tell me there, was the sound on that all right? Just uh... Yeah, I could hear it perfect here. That's good. That's, that's, I just I want to know there's not uh, feedback or anything. Um, so th that's uh, what happened next is a real difference in probably approach from the way they did things in the 1960s to the way they would go about them now. And um, that rocket was struck by lightning twice they are lightning does strike twice sometimes um, in the space of 15 seconds or so um, and that knocked out the entire electrical system but somebody knew hang on there's a spare battery and using that spare battery they were able to power it back up reset the fuel cells and they went to the moon however one of the things that they were very concerned about with the lightning strikes um, is that the parachutes, which were in the top of the nose cone, that they need to actually splash down at a later stage in the mission, that they might have been damaged. Um, this is 1960s health and safety thinking going on here. They said, well, you know, is there anything we can do about it? No, there isn't. Um, does it make any difference if we just go to the moon then? <coughs> They said, well, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, the problem only arises when they try and land. So rather than what, now I'm pretty sure they would have bought that mission. Um, but they did not do so there. They said, well, OK, let's go to the moon then. And they carried on with the rest of the mission as if that hadn't happened. Um, and they were just hopeful with fingers crossed that when it came down, the parachutes opened. Which indeed they did. So that's uh, um, Apollo 12, quite an amazing <gasps> mission. All of these missions were unique in some way in that not everything went to plan. But uh, uh, so that's that's Apollo 12. Now then, the next mission, um, subject of a fantastic film, of course, um, a Ron Howard film, 
Um, but the reality is every bit as exciting as that film. And um, um, this was Apollo 13. Um, Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert and Fred Hayes intended to land at Framora. Um, slight problem in that one of the engines shut down prematurely during the, the launch, but that was okay because really, once you, as long as you've got four engines, you've still got all your fuel, so you can just burn them a bit longer um, to, to make up for it and make sure you get into orbit. That's, that's great. Um, another aspect of Apollo 13 was that people were getting a bit bored with it, and it wasn't actually getting the TV ratings anything like Apollo's 11 and 12. Um, but it soon got much more exciting, unfortunately. Um, one of the oxygen tanks uh, in the service module behind the capsule um, had actually, it was a bit of a Friday afternoon job. It had been dropped only a few inches in the factory, which may have caused some structural damage to it. Uh, and the other thing was that when they'd done some testing on the electrics, they, they made a mistake and wired it up to a 65 volt supply instead of a 28 volt supply. And they, they believe that there was some damage to the, to, to the insulation of the wiring. So they did a 55 hours into the mission, they did a, a routine um, tank stirring thing. Um, as I understand tank stirring, um, you know, in your car, you've, you know, you've got a petrol tank and, and you've got a, a thing that floats in petrol that, uh, that basically is wired up to a lever in, in your dashboard that tells you how much fuel you've got. Of course, this doesn't work like that in zero gravity. But so what they do is the tank stirring thing, and that enables them in zero gravity to discern how much mm -hmm. oxygen is left in that tank. Um, and so that's why they, why they did it. So they did a, a, a little bit for the TV, and then they flicked the switch to uh, stir up the tanks. And this didn't go uh, at all well. Give your oxygen tanks a stir. What did you do? Nothing, I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Uh, this is Houston, uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. And the famous misquote, of course, they did not say, Houston, we have a problem. They said, Houston, we've had a problem. But they, 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 uh, they changed that to the popular belief for the film. And um, what it was, that, that tank had exploded. Now, they then followed um, the most magnificent uh, rescue mission ever, um, where they did actually come up with a plan to, to get those guys back. Just as a little aside, I will say something about that. Um, the, the method used to get them back was to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. Um, had that tank been fitted to Apollo 8, that would have been the end of them. There would have been no route to get home there. But this being Apollo 13 with the lunar module, they went through a, um, a detailed series of steps. And I'll show you the. Um, this actually came from uh, one of the flight controllers, actually. Um, who did a presentation. I've shamelessly nicked this slide from him. So there we have the, the, the oxygen tank explosion at 55 hours, 54 minutes in. They decided less than an hour later that the way to do this was not to try and do what they call directable, i.e. turn around and come back. They were two thirds of the way to the moon at the time. So actually traveling at a fair speed, um, that would take a lot of fuel to actually turn around the other way and come back. So what they did instead was they decided, uh, I'm going to move this over here, just there. Um, they decided instead to go around the moon. They also decided they couldn't use the service modules engine because that was dependent on oxygen from the tank that had just exploded. And so they instead used the lunar <coughs> module uh, engine. So they then took an hour mm -hmm. later again, the next decision to power up the lunar module. Um, power down the command and service module um, and then do all the consumables then decided that they were going to do uh, what they call free return trajectory now what this is the orbit that they were put into when they left earth was designed to enter lunar gravity and then burn the rocket and be captured by the moon so they go into lunar orbit however they decided to 
changed that rocket burn so that instead they simply flipped around the back of the moon and headed back towards Earth. Now, one of the things that is shown in the film, which I find amazing, but it is true, um, is that you see Tom Hanks, Jim Lovell, um, doing the maths required for this um, with a space pen and a piece of paper. And you see him doing this and could, because one of the things they lost in that explosion was one of the data links. They had a voice link still back to Earth, but they lost a data link. So they had to do their own calculations. And what they did was they had a guy on the ground who was checking their work as they read it out to him. So you see Tom Hanks, and he's doing some maths with a space pen and a pad. And what he's doing is addition. And you see a man on the ground checking it with a slide rule. <laughs> and there's a problem with this because slide rules are fantastic. They can do multiplication, division, squares, logs, square roots, except they can't do addition. Um, you need an abacus for that. Um, and the first pocket calculator, by the way, was invented by Hewlett Packard in 1971, a year after Apollo 13. So there's a thing for you. For, the youngsters might find this incredible that men were going to the moon before there was such a thing as a pocket calculator not even the one you can buy for 99p in a petrol station now, you know? Um, so that's a bit extraordinary. So they did that burn. Another burn, they planned another burn to actually speed up the return and target accurately for landing in the Pacific. And then the whole problem with the carbon dioxide buildup um, came about and that's where they had to do all this thing because um, the lunar module and the command module were built by different manufacturers. Um, they both had devices in them um, to use lithium hydroxide to scrub carbon dioxide out of the air. People breathe it out. Um, so they had to remove that because it becomes um, not necessarily toxic, but suffocating after a certain concentration. And they both used lithium ion, uh, sorry, uh, lithium hydroxide canisters to do this. But um, the lunar module manufacturer had made theirs square and the command module manufacturer had made theirs round. And so they had to go through all this thing using duct tape. There is nothing that cannot be fixed with duct tape. Um, so they built an interface between the two so they could, they could use the command modules canisters in the lunar module. They powered down the lunar module. Um, they got the, the CO2 removal process going. They were, all of them and one in particular were, were, were not well people at this point because having turned everything off they were sort of surviving in, in a, an environment of two or three celsius uh, so that wasn't good but they uh, they managed to aim the spacecraft accurately enough by eye look using the edge of the earth as a, as a thing to aim it at um, which is quite miraculous because i'm told that when you come back from the moon You've got to come in at the right angle to Earth's atmosphere. If you hit the, the atmosphere too hard, you bounce off and you're never seen again. You come in too steep and you just crash into the ocean at an uncontrolled speed. So to get it just right, you've got to be exactly spot on. And they, they were a little bit wrong. Um, but I'm told it's like posting a letter through your letterbox from about 10 miles away. That's, that's how accurate you've got to be. And that's what they... They did, and they did successfully splash down in the Pacific. There's a slight, slight red herring with this one. Um, the movie shows this a bit wrong. Um, the movie says that they come in too shallow. And the reason being that's given is, is they go, hang on, we didn't collect any lunar rocks. And what happened there... Um, is, is wrong because actually, although they didn't collect any lunar rocks, they had a whole lunar module that was supposed to stay on the moon. Mm -hmm. So so, uh, so that's probably, I think they were coming in a bit heavy, if anything, um, but they did it correctly. They had the longest um, period of radio silence so as, as, the, as the spacecraft um, enters the atmosphere and burns up. Um, hopefully it doesn't completely burn up. The heat shield takes all the, the heat out of it. Um, the spacecraft is enveloped in, in hot air 
plas superheated plasma, in fact, and that blots out radio communications. And the usual um, bl radio blackout is about four minutes. Um, Apollo 13's no pressure uh, was six minutes. Um, and you know when, when they really did want to hear from them because they, you know, they really weren't sure about the parachutes and stuff there. So that's um, that is Apollo 13. That's how they they got Apollo 13 home. And it all worked, and they and they did actually brand it in the end a successful failure, not a failure, because they didn't lose the astronauts, um, even though they they didn't get to walk on the moon. So poor old Jim Lovell, he's now been to the moon twice without uh, actually getting to walk on it, which uh, uh, was a bit of a disappointment, I suppose. Sorry, Paul. Yes. Sorry, I don't know if there's, if there's something up with Zoom, but it's not allowing me just to. Can you see the people that's looking to sit in the yeah, meeting room? No, I, I can see it now. Yeah, I, yeah. Can you click on that? Because it just. I just click on it. Admit, let them all in. Let Two them on in. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. Sorry. Two of them is Terry Mosley. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Right. Oh, yes. Yes. If anyone, if that turns up again, I'll uh, I'll do that. Yeah. I think that is the problem. Yes. If you, if you're a co-host, you can do it, and if you're if you make me the sole host, can't. Anyway, so that was Apollo 13 in a, in a nutshell. It deserves a talk all of its own, really, I think. Um, but the next Apollo, they, they waited a while. They obviously investigated and learned things uh, from the, the experience of Apollo 13, but they, um, um, they, they didn't cancel the program or anything like that. They, they, they learned from it. They made certain design changes to the... Um, to the spacecraft, uh, not the least of which was an extra, excuse me, an extra um, breathing oxygen tank separate from the fuel oxygen tank. Uh, up, up to Apollo 13, they were all the same oxygen, but uh, uh, they decided to have an extra special uh, breathing tank just so that if they did lose um, the fuel oxygen tank again, they hadn't lost the air as well. Um, so Apollo 14 took off uh, 31st January 1971. Uh, with Alan Shepard on board. And now I always forget this little detail. Alan Shepard was, of course, um, the first American in uh, suborbital space in 1961 on the Mercury Redstone. Now, and I forget whether he had a heart murmur or an ear problem. One was Deke Slayton and one was Alan Shepard. And the two of them had, one had an ear problem and one had um, a heart problem. Anyway, they both got sorted out eventually. And Alan Shepard, um, was actually to to originally have gone on Apollo 13, but he decided that he needed more training and stuff. Uh, and he, I suppose he struck lucky in the end in getting on Apollo 14. Um, so there, uh, um, the command and service module Kitty Hawk and the lunar module Antares, and they went up to take over Apollo 13's mission landing in Framora Highlands. Uh, so um, they, did all this it all worked fairly well they had a major problem though um, with uh, when they actually separated the spacecraft um, the lunar module sits behind the command and service module in the Saturn V stack um, and at, at part way from the earth to the moon they take it out and then they dock it to the front of the command module and it took them actually six attempts to do this the mechanism was just stuck um, and so they had six goes at it and, um, and it worked okay. Um, but you've got to remember that it's got to work again when they come, they have to undock it, go down to the moon and then come back from the moon and dock with the command module again. So having taken six goes at it the first time, one wonders, you know, whether that uh, is something that they would just attempt to do now or, or again, whether they would, they would scrub the mission in, in modern uh, thinking, I'm not sure. Um, the other thing they did, that there was a fault uh, with the abort light, um, which kept coming on. This was on the lunar module. On the way down, the abort light kept coming on intermittently. And what would happen um, if that happened during the descent was that the mission would abort itself and, and, blast, the, uh, and blast the lunar module back into orbit um, around the moon. So, so actually... A programmer did something that would be fairly routine these days. Just he applied a patch to the Apollo guidance computer that just locked out that abort light. Um, that would be probably quite easy to do now. At that point, it had never been done um, at that sort of distance. So that was uh, um, a bit scary for them, no doubt. 
Uh, and uh, they also had some problems locking the radar onto the moon. It didn't actually see the moon until they were within 18,000 feet. And uh, then that was a uh, thing. But actually, um, Alan Shepard landed that and uh, he, he got the most accurate landing of all the lunar landings, the Apollos. But there's a few things that Apollo 14 is famous for. And um, one of which was probably the most expensive round of golf ever. So let's have a look at this. Oops. Why aren't you? Uh... Here we go. Uh, Houston, what are you looking at up? You might recognize what I have in my hand is the uh, handle for the contingency sample return. I just so happens to have a genuine six iron on the bottom of it. And in my left hand, I have a little white pellet that's familiar to millions of Americans. Uh, drop it down. Unfortunately, the suit is so stiff, I can't do this with two hands, but I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. They got more dirt than ball this side. The more dirt than ball, here we go again. That looked like a slice to me, out. There we go. Three is a die. One more. Miles and miles and miles. Very good, Dan. <laughs> so miles and miles and miles, he reckons. Um, unfortunately, um, I think sort of modern estimates of that were actually what about 50 or 60 yards, um, which which isn't bad actually. I mean, one sixth gravity, you'd like to get a, um, a, a fair distance, but of course, he's you know, he's wrapped up in a spacesuit, um, holding a makeshift six iron in, in, in one big fat glove. So, I think, um, you know, there's no chance that I would hit the ball at all there, actually. So, I think he did, he did pretty well at that. There's uh, that's that's the uh, uh, the actual real Apollo 14 command module with me standing next to it at the Kennedy Space Center. That one, that's uh, that's Kitty Hawk. Uh, it's there, and you can see it's uh, it looks well worn for its trip into space, but it survived um, beautifully. And look at all the the intricate metalwork just for opening and shutting the door. It's a it's a really um, amazingly designed machine, the Apollo. It's uh, quite something else. So the next Apollo was Apollo 15, um, launched 26th of July um, in 1971. Um, Command Service Module Endeavour, Lunar Module Falcon. Now what they did here um, was they actually modified the design of the lunar lander so that it actually uh, had a, a far bigger sort of bottom section to it that could actually carry the lunar rover in it. Um, so they actually managed to get 209 kilograms of four-wheeled electric vehicle um, into into um, in, into the bottom part of the of the lunar lander. Um, they they changed the the flight profiles a bit to to actually lift the extra weight, um, and likewise the lander would need to burn more fuel to to get down. Um, but it, it, was, it was an evolving design, and that's what they did. They landed at Hadley Rill, and they went. They did they did four. Um, EVAs increasing every time these um, uh, three of which were with the lunar rovers what about the the entire the entire Apollo program and this is you know um, it is only fairly recently um, that America has been able to put men into space at all for the first time since 2011 and yet I was nine years old in July 1971, and they were driving electric cars on the moon. Now, how ridiculous would that sound to a youngster? Now, they say, "Well, no, we've only just got to, you know, to put men in space. We've been doing it on Soyuz craft for years, of course." But um, America's space capacity ended with the end of the shuttle program. Well, that's the 
Um, Apollo, a, a bit of a naughty thing. I'll just show you a little video clip of it. Scott would make history, cancelling a stamp on an interplanetary envelope. I'm very proud to have the opportunity here to play Postman. What could be a better place to cancel the stamp than right here? It's Hadley Real. Right, so they took some stamps up with them. Um, and uh, they, they actually did this little bit of history of, of franking stamps on the moon for the first time. And then they sold them to a stamp dealer for a lot of money. Um, and that was considered very, very naughty. And those guys, they never went anywhere again. Um, that was uh, that was really quite, uh, quite controversial. Um, but they did other things well as well. well. In my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons... Uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So they are actually carried that out, uh, that experiment, and uh, proved uh, Galileo's theory that it is the only difference really is air resistance and no air, no difference. So that's uh, the, the, the hammer and the feather um, experiment. Now that is um, that's a, a mock up um, of the. Uh, of the lunar rover and uh, I'll just have a show you a thing or two about this um because we'll come back to it at a later stage um but here we've got sort of you know we've got rubber tires for suspension it's got an electric motor powered by batteries and stuff here it's got its own SHF radio link to earth this dish points at earth so it's not dependent upon the lunar module for communication it can do it, it itself directly it's got a camera on it here and that's important. We'll see uh, more of that in a minute. So Apollo 16, um, the second to last Apollo, as it turned out, because at this stage they were rearranging missions uh, quite a lot to uh, to cut them down. Uh, but the, the the command module's Casper, the lunar module was Orion, 16th to 27th of April 1972, uh, and that was uh, John Young, Charlie Jute, and Ken Mattingly. Uh, went to the Descartes Highlands with the, the Lunar Rover again, and they actually drove the Lunar Rover a total of 16.6 .6 miles altogether, um, visiting a number of locations there, um, deploying science experiments. So uh, let's have a let's have a look at Apollo 16. This is this is the Lunar Rover. Come out, That's all, Mark. That max acceleration? No. Man, you are really bouncing. Is he on the ground at all? That's 10 kilometers. Huh? He's got about two wheels on the ground. He's a big rooster tail out of all four wheels. And as he turns, he skids. The back end breaks loose just like on snow. Come on back, John. Hey, the deck is running. Man, I'll tell you, Andy's never seen a driver like this. Okay, when he hits the craters and starts bouncing is when he gets his rooster tail. He makes sharp turns. Hey, that was a good stop. Those wheels just locked. Mark off. Okay. Do you want to do it one more time? Yeah. Got about a minute, five seconds that okay, time. Okay, mark on. Okay, you could have gone the other way. But go ahead. There's the big craters there, though, aren't they? Yeah, I don't want to know those holes. They want four minutes worth, John. But it was a minute and five. Maybe you could do it twice more. Surely. Okay, turn sharp. <laughs> I have no desire to turn sharp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a sharpie. Hey, that's great. Man, those things... 
when, it, when those wheels really dig in, Don John, when you turn, is when you get the rooster tail. The suspension uh, system on that thing is fantastic. That yeah. sounds good. Uh, we sound like we've probably got enough of the Grand Prix. We're willing to let you go on from here. Call out a Grand Prix. Okay. Man, that was all four wheels off the ground there. Okay, Max, stop. Okay, I don't want to do that. Okay, excuse me. They say that's a no-no. See, that, that to me is fantastic. So, the, so they're, they're a quarter of a million miles from home and they're, they're completely out on their own and whatever. And they're just chucking this thing around like a go-kart. It's extraordinary, isn't it? But uh, um, amazing footage. That's uh, you know, driving electric cars on the moon. Fantastic. Okay, so the, the final Apollo moon mission um, was um, December 1972, Apollo 17. Uh, and one of the, this was the first time that they'd actually got a scientist to the moon. Um, Harrison Smith was a, a geologist and he was um, sent up, uh, he, was, he was moved forward from Apollo 18. And it was the other thing we'll see in a moment, it was the only time a Saturn V was launched at night and it's spectacular. So being the last mission, they did the longest EVA, 22 hours, three minutes, 57 seconds in, in three, three different goes of seven hours and a bit each. Um, and uh, an amazing mission. So let's let's look at that launch first. Minus 30 seconds and continuing on now. Continuing on at the T-minus 26 second mark, T-minus 25. We'll get a final guidance uh, release at the T-minus 17 second mark. T-minus 17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, Seven. Ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the tower. Roger, tower. You're all complete. We're in the roll, Bob. We're in a looking great for us good on all five engines. Okay, babe, it's looking good here. Roll is complete. We are pitching. Okay, babe. Let's check the angle. 30 seconds, we're going up. Man, oh, well. 30 seconds and uh, 17 is go. 17, you go. Okay, one minute, 68 degrees. Okay. Everything looks great over here, didn't you? Okay. Okay. Stand by for Max. Coming through Max, too. We'll be at 68 degrees. Okay. Team, stand by for mode one Bravo. Mark, mode one Bravo. Roger, one Bravo, we're going one minute. Team, you're looking great. Right on the line. Okay, we got the RCS command. Team, you have feet wet, feet wet. Roger, feet wet. Yeah, this thing shakes like the sun. Yeah, that's max Q. Wait till we get our max Q. Stay down there, Q meter. Yeah. Okay, okay, we're going Jesus Christ, hold on. Look at that son of a bitch. Man. Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> you know, Bob, I guess we got all five. <laughs> yeah, they're looking here, looking good. Okay, stand by the star. Sure felt like it. Stand by, hold it. I think we oh. saw them all from here. Jack and the first is going all five up there, running good. So there you go. Who thinks the crazy thing about that is that you can't see the rocket? Because of course it's nighttime. Uh, you can only actually see the, the 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 fire that it's riding on, which is amazing. Um, so that's Apollo 17, which uh, which went up uh, to to the moon, and the uh, Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt became the last two men to walk on the moon, and that of course still stands to this day, 1972, December 1972. Now then, here's a bit of footage, and let me tell you. The conspiracy theorists, they absolutely love this one. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Let's just watch this. This is the takeoff um, of the lunar lander coming back from the moon. Fourth stage. stage. Fourth. Engine arm is out. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Ignition. Right away, Houston. Reds are good. Excellent. Over. Now, Jerry, you have good thrust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Okay, coming through 1,500 feet, and H dot looks good. So, what happened there then? Um, well, first of all, you see the lander on the moon, as we see now. Then, just before it takes off, your cameraman, he zooms out a bit. And then he pans up, tracking the object perfectly. And the conspiracy theorists take that as proof positive that there was still a cameraman on the moon, i.e. in a studio, <laughs> um, because the only two guys that could have you know, done that, they were inside the spacecraft. So how could they have operated a camera? But here's the true story. What they actually did was they used the lunar rover, and we saw earlier that it had that uh, it had its own camera and its own radio link to Earth. And a man in mission control anticipated the launch of the spacecraft and started moving the camera. Remember, he's got one and a quarter seconds of radio time before anything happens, uh, before the radio signal gets to the moon. Um, and so he did all that early and did it perfectly. We showed, well, that's a bit difficult as well. Yes. But this wasn't the first time he'd done it. He tried it on Apollos 15 and 16 as well. And it was a case of third time lucky that he actually got the footage he wanted with Apollo 17. And that was his last chance anyway. So, um, so that was the, the, the footage of, uh, of the lunar lander. If you ever get challenged about, ha ha, that bit of film proves it. That, that was done in a studio. No, it was, it was far cleverer than that. So, right, here's a, here's a summary of really what happened to the, to the Apollos. Um, this was the original mission plan. That Apollo 12 would go to the moon in 1969, followed by Apollo 13 in April 1970. They happened, of course, that, that Apollo 13 didn't get there. Apollo 14 was going to go to Litro Crater, but actually that got Apollo 13's mission, mission to Fra um, Apollo 15 was effectively cancelled because... Apollo 16 was to be the first lunar rover mission, i.e. what's called a J-class mission. Um, but that was, Apollo 16 became Apollo 15. And likewise here, um, the, these all sort of moved up one. So what actually happened, Apollo, the first thing that happened was that Apollo 20's Saturn V um, was taken off the list and the Saturn V was given to Skylab. Um, Apollo's 18 and 19 uh, were cancelled shortly after. Um, let me just have a. Yeah, after after Apollo thirteen, they cancelled eighteen and nineteen. Um, Apollo fifteen became the first rover mission, and there were two others: Apollo's sixteen and seventeen. So they lost the, the, the three missions effectively. Um, and now, you can get various accounts of why this was. Um, Usually, the explanation given is that the American government needed the money for other things, uh, most notably the Vietnam War that was going on at the time. Um, the other was that, um, you know, that Richard Nixon, well, it wasn't his project and he, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was always John F. Kennedy's project. Uh, and so Richard Nixon, being of the other party, was a bit, a bit hostile to it and 
took away the money. And But the one that's come out more recently is that actually NASA themselves weren't terribly upset about this because they had actually said to Richard Nixon, said, look, you know, if we carry on doing this, someone's going to get killed because they had so many near misses, frankly, um, that, that that was inevitable sooner or later that they were doing this with you know, hardware that they shouldn't have been doing this with at all, really. Um, if you look at uh, you know how that technology compares to what we have now, um, so so they weren't upset about that. But um, of course, all the money for space then went to shuttle, which um, turned out to be. I mean, it gave us thirty years of great great missions, but uh, at the loss of two craft, and it wasn't that great an idea, really. Um, so so there was you know there was anyway there was one more bit of Apollo that actually happened, and that was the only part of the Apollo applications program that came to us. So let's talk about Apollo applications a bit. Um, they started actually thinking about this back as far as 1966. So, said, well, what can we do with Saturn V rockets? What else can we do? And they put all, together, all sorts of plans together. They were going to build a lunar base in four phases from 1969 to 76. Uh, they were going to have a lunar exploration system, which was a sort of lunar base type thing as well. Um, lunar escape systems, they say, if we're going to go to the moon, then we might need to get off it quite quickly if anything goes wrong. Um, the one that's amazing, the manned Venus, that they actually did, the only one of all those things that they actually did was Skylab. And they built Skylab. Um, it wasn't a great success that they hoped it would be, but let's have a look at Skylab. Um, there were four Skylab missions. Skylab 1 uh, was the last Saturn V, and it was launched on May the 14th, 1973, with nobody on it, no crew. It was an unmanned mission. It just had Skylab on top of um, the first two stages of the Saturn V, and the job of the Saturn V was to put it into orbit. Um, partially successful. Um, things broke on the way up. Um, they lost the solar panel and they lost a, a, a micrometeoroid shield. Um, and they had one jammed when they tried to, when the solar panels jammed when they tried to put it out. But that's okay because they were sending a crew up um, 11 days later on a Saturn 1B rocket. And I'll just show you the picture. Um, here we see a Saturn 1B rocket. Now, the previous Saturn 1B rockets, um, only one of which carried men, uh, was Apollo 7. But that was launched from a different launch complex, um, LC-34, which is a bit down the, the, the coast from, from this one, which is this, this is 39B, launch complex 39B, uh, modified for the Saturn 1B with what they called the milk stool. Um, that lifted up so that the top of it was at the same height as a Saturn V, but obviously it's a shorter spacecraft, so a bit had to be put in to, to, to make that up. Um, the Apollo 1 fire, of course, had taken place at Launch Complex 34-2. Uh, that, that didn't, that didn't uh, launch, of course, um, but of course Apollo 5 and Apollo 7, um, 5 was unmanned, 7 was manned, um, were the only other Saturn 1B launches from 34. There were some test missions earlier as well, um, which were mostly Saturn ones. Um, but the, this, these three, um, Skylabs two, three, and four, um, they took men up for quite a long time. Actually, that was they were they were doing twenty eight, fifty nine, and eighty four day missions to Skylab. We'll have a look inside Skylab. It's quite nice actually. It's made out of the the fuel tank of the of the top stage. Um, yeah, it's got an airlock through into the um, into the capsule and all sorts of storage and you can even see you know you could even get a shower in Skylab they have a waste management compartment which looks pretty much like a kitchen sink to me I'm sure it's a bit more complicated than that because of course it's zero gravity and so on but that was Skylab so it wasn't a complete failure um, but it didn't quite really do all they wanted and it got cut short uh, with the lack of money. So, so there were Skylab 2, 3, and 4, and that was it. Uh, there was some hope that Skylab might be uh, rescued with, a, with either a fifth Skylab 
a mission to take some fuel up to push it into a higher orbit. Um, or they were sort of hoping that it would last until the shuttle was operational. Um, but that didn't happen until 1981. And we'll see in a minute that Skylab crashed to the ground in 1979. Now then, the Apollo Venus flyby mission. This is, this is crazy. Um, right, this is a launch. Now then, let's just get the, the things. Here's the Earth. Here is the Earth in April the 5th, 1972, and the Saturn V, uh, effectively a Skylab, roughly speaking a Skylab. We'll look at the craft in a minute. Um, it launches there um, away and goes towards the Sun and towards Venus, and it catches up with Venus on August the 23rd, 1972. And at that point, Earth has moved round as well. And it's still fairly close to Venus, actually, almost at its closest point, not quite. Um, there, so the radio time is not, uh, not huge. But then that carries on and goes outside Earth's orbit for a bit, and then intercepts the Earth on March the 30th, 1973, almost a year um, after, after it launched. So that's a one year, three man mission where they fly past Venus in only a few hours, um, get some pictures and then come back. And it's the whole thing takes a year. Now, they didn't do it, of course, um, but you've got to only, you can only imagine what the problems with that would be. Um, not least of which is what sort of state they'd be in when they got back. Well, we have mm. we have had people in space for a year at the, uh, on the space station, but uh, they're not they're not in good condition when they get back. I tell you, and uh, um, and you know how do three people live in that confined space for a year and not go nuts? You know that's uh, that, that I think you know we don't really know the answer to that one. We've sort of we have done sort of Earth simulations of locking people up for for quite a while, but um, I, I don't think it's. Uh, I'm not sure that would have worked. I, I, I you know, we, we don't know, but uh, I'm just never been quite convinced of that one. This was the craft they intended to use. So here, this is all familiar. Um, this is an ordinary take you to the moon and back um, command and service module. They use uh, the capsule to get back to Earth when this is all over and done with. They've got the docking. Uh, module here um, that covers that's got the life support oxygen uh, solar panels communication water purifiers enough to last for a year there and then the living quarters is made out of the Saturn 4b stage um, after they've they've actually built the quarters in there then used it as a fuel tank then completely vented out all the fuel when they finished firing this rocket here to, to actually get them into the right uh, solar orbit and um, then that's got living quarters in once the fuel comes out. Amazing. Okay, so now, now this is something outside of Apollo applications that they, <coughs> that they did this. They did the Apollo Soyuz test project. It came, it came out of uh, detente. Um, you remember that time when uh, we got to the stage where the Cold War was really um, out of control and nuclear arms were proliferating at a very high rate and uh, uh, Nixon decided he was going to do something about it and he talked to the Russians and they yep yeah, they agreed that they would uh, they would you know they would trade with each other to sort of get rid of some of these weapons and they would do things to to you know friendly things to to help each other out and one of them was the Apollo Soyuz test project they put one Apollo um, into into low Earth orbit and one Soyuz, and they built the module that would dock the two spacecraft together. Um, they trained crews to two cosmonauts, three astronauts, and um, they 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 did this. Uh, few fewer things here. Um, Tom Stafford, Vance Brand, and Deke Slayton. Uh, Deke Slayton, remember, was the manager of the astronaut office because he was one of the original Mercury Seven who hadn't flown. Um, due to either a heart condition or an ear condition, whichever one Alan Shepard didn't have, I've forgotten. Um, oh, there we are, atrial fibrillation. He was the one with the heart condition. So, so Alan Shepard was the one with the ear problem, um, many years disease, I think, or something like that. Um, but they managed the, the astronaut office. So the two, uh, Leonov and Kubasov were the two cosmonauts. Uh, the Soyuz went up first on the 15th of July, 1975. Um, the Apollo which is not, absolutely emphatically not Apollo 18. It was simply Apollo. It was just called Apollo. Um, and that took the docking module, which was the intricate machine that 
tied the Russian and American systems together. And they docked over France at uh, 20 past two, 20 past four in the afternoon on the 17th of July, 1975. So a few little stories here. Um, the training they had to do for this, of course, they had to learn each other's languages. So the, the American guys had to learn Russian, the, the Russians had to learn uh, English. Um, and they found that the way that this worked best is if they spoke to each other in each other's language. That is to say, the Russians would speak English, the Americans would speak would, would speak Russian, and they'd actually get along best that way. Now, um, I've, there's a note here I've made, the pool table incident. Um, the, the American astronauts, the, the three American astronauts, spent quite a lot of time training in Russia at uh, what is now, I suppose, Baikonur um, you know, Star City. And they sort of wondered if they were being bugged because this was the Soviet Union in, in the 70s. So you know, the answer was probably yes. So Tom Stafford had this great idea. They said they had this conversation, said, you know what? There's, um, we've got quite a lot of spare time here. Um, wouldn't it be good if we had something like a pool table to help us pass the time? And the following day, a pool table appeared. <laughs> so uh, that'll be a yes then. Um, so that's what they, they did then. They shared crafts and food stories, scientific experiments. Um, Alexei Leonov and Tom Stafford became lifelong, very close friends. Um, they, they, and the whole thing was a great success. And uh, there we are. That's, uh, Tom Stafford was from Oklahoma. And of course, the, the, uh, Alexei Leonov joked that uh, there were three languages, English, Russian, and Oklahomsky, which is... Uh, a good one, but um, unfortunately, although that was a great success and it got them cooperating um, in space, which was fantastic, um, then uh, the Soviets in 1979 invaded Afghanistan and uh, things turned a bit cold again. So that didn't really um, go anywhere much after that. Um, but what they, did, what they had done by establishing that principle that they could work together in space, there were more missions in the 80s and 90s with the Mir shuttle um, collaborations where space shuttles went up to the Mir space station, the Russian Mir space station. And of course, it became very handy when the Americans realized that they couldn't actually do space station freedom, as it was to be called, um, all by themselves, and they needed international cooperation. Um, and of course, that work that was done in 1975 um, came in very handy when the Russians were brought into the International Space Station, as it became. And um, just as a little aside, the reason that we can see the International Space Station from Ireland is that it is in a 51 and a half degree orbit, um, for the reason that to get Russian money, it had to be visible from Moscow. So there you are, see that, uh, that mission has led to um, great things and we actually benefit from it ourselves through being able to look up and see the space station from Ireland, which is great. Um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the crew, the five men crew, um, the three American astronauts, the two Russian cosmonauts, uh, Kubasov and Leonov. And one more thing I have to mention. We talked about Skylab and we, we, we hoped that there would be a fifth Skylab mission that would um, take up some fuel to boost Skylab into a higher orbit so that it would last a bit longer. Um, but um, that never happened. And also it was hoped that the shuttle would be um, working in time, but it wasn't. It was delayed until 1981, lots of delays on the shuttle. Um, solar activity in the mid 70s increased and uh, that, that has the effect of pushing the atmosphere of the Earth outwards a bit so, um, so that the drag on Skylab increased. And um, so actually in the end Skylab re-entered the atmosphere and crashed into Western Australia on the 11th of July 1979. And you know you think that's a bit dangerous but it was okay because you could buy at the time and there's a young lady modeling one here a Skylab protective helmet. <laughs> Um, which was guaranteed, uh, money back guarantee, um, if you were killed by Skylab, bits of Skylab falling out of the sky, uh, and your Skylab protective helmet didn't protect you, you would get your money back. So there we are. So that's uh, that's how they, they dealt with things in those days. Collector's item, surely. I'm just going to mention one last little thing. And this is um, a 
graph of solar activity throughout the 20th century. And if you notice, if you were going to be, you know, we never really found out the hard way what would actually happen if a solar flare um, interrupted uh, any of the moon missions. Um, because if you look at the, you know, the, the solar peaks either side of the time that they were going on, they were doing all this during solar cycle 20. And solar cycle 20 was the smallest one for years um, either, in either direction. You know, there's sort of there's three decades either side there um, where the solar peaks were much bigger. Um, so they were very, very lucky in that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is really all I have to say. So are there any questions? Unmute yourselves and talk to me. How's it going, Paul? John here. Just, just a simple question. You know, like uh, Apollo had its success and failures, but in, in a funny sort of way, would some of the failures have helped the success of the whole? You know, oh, I think, and, and the American going forward, like. I, I'm sure that's true um, because because they seem to have the culture. They didn't, as far as I can tell, really have a blame culture when things went wrong. They had a culture of, of learning loads from everything. So I, mean, I think they probably learned more from Apollo 13 than perhaps any of the other missions in, 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 in terms of how to do space flight. So, so I think, um, yes, that's, that's very true that you know, failures are, are useful in that sense. Um, you know, as long as nobody gets killed and apart from, I mean, the Apollo 1 fire, <coughs> the point that, that, that you know, three people did get killed in that, but they didn't die in vain because they were able to redesign the spacecraft so that all the things that they did wrong in the first place, they didn't do wrong again, they sorted them out. They, you know, they no longer used um, pure oxygen at that point because in pure oxygen, uh, anything that burns, burns five times better than it does in air. Um, so they realized that was a bad idea and doors that open inwards, you know, no, the door opens outwards, surely. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, a mistake they made. So, so they did, always learn from mistakes they got better by making mistakes I'll, so that i can see you guys i will st stop the share on this but uh, but do do talk away and do fire up your camera so i can see you too just on a follow on to that paul just you know i, I was kind of that was part of me me thinking as well but the other part of me thinking was like did the failures you know and the, the success of some of the failures help to get the american public behind the whole thing as well and it was easier what was tv coverage important yeah i mean I, I do think that by the time of apollo 13 it had become routine yeah. and apollo 13 was anything but routine so um i, I do think it, it brought people back to it people realized that this just isn't guys playing with expensive toys this is dangerous you know um uh, this is this is real edge of the envelope stuff, and um, e even now it seems edge of the envelope, doesn't it? So, so I think I think you're right. I think it did help. Thanks, Pat. Paul, um, sorry I missed the beginning there. I had trouble getting connected, which is a a long story I'll not go into. But I enjoyed so I. <laughs> Apollo fourteen onwards. Um, yeah. I was lucky enough to have dinner at uh, Cape Kennedy with Al Warden, and he mentioned the uh, stamps incident. Of course, he was the command module pilot, so he oh. didn't actually go down on the surface. Yeah. Now, he was a little bit ambiguous, but he seemed to sort of imply that since he wasn't one of the ones that actually went down on the moon, uh, and, you know, they, they didn't actually sign the stamps, I suppose, when they were on the surface. But I got the impression that he felt he was a bit hard done by, uh, by being banned because he wasn't one of the, the prime movers of the stamp uh, incident. So have you any other information on that? I, I don't really, I don't know, but Terry, did you ask him? Did you know? Did um, <laughs> <laughs> it, there were so many other questions I wanted to ask him that that wasn't actually top of the list, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't actually. So. Uh, uh, that's why I was interested. Look, uh, it's it's an interesting story. 
Uh, can, obviously, I don't think there was anything ever written into their contracts to say that they couldn't do something like that. But it was just, you know, they were taking advantage of what NASA had done and getting them to the moon to sort of enrich themselves. And, and that was just considered not acceptable. Because one of the things that, you know, they were basically civil servants and not actually paid a fantastic amount of money for yeah. what they were doing. So. Um, uh, um, you can understand why you know, where the motivation to make a bit extra on the side comes from, uh, um, and I'm sure they they did in other ways um, afterwards anyway. But um, but I, I, I forget the, you know, the exact detail of that whole stamped thing, but but it was all a bit dodgy, should we say? <laughs> they yeah, to keep those stamps. Hmm? Did he manage to keep those stamps? Did he bring them home and keep them in his possession? No, he sold them to a German stamp dealer, I believe, and made that's where he made his money. Um, and they got, you know, they've been passed around all sorts of people, apparently. It seems strange that he was able to do that, you know, because yeah. even the Apollo missions, when they were wearing their Omega watches, and they had to hand them back as soon as landing, yeah. they weren't even allowed to keep those, you know, yeah. things like that. But, um, the, the, well, the he made a good pretty penny on those. So he did Indeed, yeah. There, there's quite a few things. I mean, I don't think... Um, I'm not sure that taking, you know, um, the head of a six iron up was part of uh, Alan Shepard's actual itinerary, you know? <laughs> but uh, but he did. I suppose he wanted to leave. Mostly. Yeah.